All right. It had to be something we forget. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk a lot about systems and, and what I just explained is what I mean when I'm talking about the system and, and where it starts and stop really is, is up to, to you to kind of define that a little bit. I'm also gonna talk about this concept of resilience a lot. And um, this is the sort of main idea, if you like, that we work with and it's the main idea that I'm gonna um, bring these concepts from is this idea of resilience. And so what does it mean? And everyone's got their own interpretation. You'll hear from you know, different people, they've all got their own uh, idea of what resilience means. And I'd, I just wanna go through how we use this term and, and we'll go dig deeper into this over the next few weeks. But if you think about, um, you know, a, a, a person, that, that person um, or a business has some kind of aspiration for the future. So we've got something that we desire, you know, that we want the future to be about. And that might be about having a, you know, a good life with our, our family, or it might be about producing something in particular in the future, or it might be about, you know, achieving some kind of personal goal. What happens, um, you know, this is, this is part of life is that there's going to be adverse events. There's going to be things that impact on us in some way or another. And some of those things are things that we can anticipate that we know about, you know, disasters, natural disasters. Um, some of those things we won't know about or anticipate. There'll be things that come along and impact on us. So, but there'll be these adverse events that impact on us. And what that does has the effect of actually pushing us away or making it harder to achieve those goals. And, and, and if that persists, you know, that, that's where we start to get these, you know, impacts of stress, if you like, on us. And I'll talk more about that uh, in more detail in a minute. A really common idea that people have about resilience is that it's about bouncing back. So you think of those, those impacts that people have had, um, those adverse events have sort of um, impacted on them, pushing them away or keeping them away from cheap, achieving their goals. And, and we'll often hear this idea about bouncing back. And, and resilience is just about bouncing back. And I, I really want to stress that really, it is about bouncing back, but it's also about bouncing forward. It's about how we move um, and use that adversity to take, you know, to build off and to take us forward. And so um, we're not just focused on recovery of just getting back to where we were. We're actually saying, you know, how can we bounce forward? How can we adapt? How can we transform if we need to? We're still going to have adverse events. We're still going to have things impact on us. There's no getting away from that. But by being more resilient, by being more prepared for some of those things, by using that experience, by adapting, and in some cases avoiding some of those things, what we'll do is lessen the impact of those and we might change the types of events that we're vulnerable to in the future. So we're not going to get away from, we're never going to get away from adverse events. There's always going to be things impacting on us. But... Um, by being more resilient, by learning about things, by being able to adapt positively, uh, we'll hopefully be able to reduce the impact of those things, maybe change the things that we're vulnerable to, avoid some things, etc. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on this idea of not just bouncing back, but on bouncing forward and this potential for, for the you know, growth um, and for the possibility, new possibilities to open up, to create new options, new connections, and that's where we get kind of new opportunities, new growth that comes through um, after those adverse events. So that's the kind of idea that we want to put forward through these um, sessions. And so if we think about that idea of bouncing back, a, a useful kind of, you know, metaphor to have in your brain, image to have in your brain is when we're talking about bouncing back, we're talking about a shock absorber. If you like, something that can absorb an impact and help us bounce back. But we're also talking about springboards, um, way to spring forward um, when we're talking about that bouncing forward. So um, it, it's good to keep that in mind that we're not just talking about that, you know, bouncing back that kind of shock absorber. We're talking about that springboard and how do we go forward. And so if we think about um, when we come back to our system, this idea of our system as a farm system and a farming system and how it's linked to ecosystems, it's linked to the economic system and to these broader social systems we can really start to ask questions about the resilience of what? What is it that we want to make resilient? Is it just our farm business? Is it just our ecosystem um, or our farm ecosystem? Is it our community? Um, is it the economic system? Is it the political system? Is it the, 
you know, the social systems, whatever. And so we can start to ask some questions about what, what are we trying to make resilient here? So if we're, if we're really focused on, you know, the future, future-proofing our farm and our farm business, and we're asking this question, well, we need to, if we, we think we need to be resilient, what do we, what is it that we're trying to make resilient? And in our work, I see people sometimes fall into a trap of thinking that resilience and building resilience is just about um, being tough or being robust, you know, so that, so that um, you know, nothing gets knocked over. And, and the reality is that that's not going to work in the long term. It might work for some things, but it's not something that you can sustain in the long term. There's always going to be some kind of shock that you're vulnerable to that's going to knock you over. It's better in my mind to ask those questions. What are we trying to make resilient? So being very clear about that. And then what do we need to, you know, so where do we need to strengthen or build resilience to, you know, um, in relation to that, once we, we know what we want to make resilient, we can focus our efforts. But also what do we need to build resilience to? So being very clear about um, the resilience to what? And, and so understanding the things that can impact your business uh, or impact you personally, understanding things that impact your your landscape, your your um, ecosystem that you're farming on, understanding things that can impact on your wider community. And some of those we know and know well. So we know the impact of drought, we know the impacts of fires. Um, but sometimes, you know, things come along like COVID or other types of impacts that come along, or it can be the combination of those impacts. So you know, I live in northeast Victoria. We got hit pretty hard by fires in summer, and you know we've talked a lot about with the um, emergency services. What if it had been the other way around? What if it had been COVID then the bushfires? What would it have looked like? And it would have been a very different kind of ball game if that sequence was different. So, some things we can anticipate. Some things we don't know about, you know, COVID sort of came out of the blue for us, even though it was foreseeable and it was foreseen, but, you know, it really kind of knocked us because we weren't really prepared for that. But it can also be the combination of things um, or the sequence of things and how they happen and the timing of things. So asking those questions, they're really powerful. They're simple, but they're really powerful. What am I trying to make resilient here? Is it is it actually the business? Is it the family unit? Is it the you know, the, the overall kind of setup that we're trying to make resilient, or are we focused on, you know, parts of that? Or are we focused more at thinking about, you know, the landscape, the community, whatever it might be? And then to what? What things do we need to worry about? And spending some time thinking about those things. And they're simple questions, but actually they're really powerful questions to ask yourself, um, your family, within your business or within your community about what is it that we care about? And what is it that we think we need to make resilient? And what do we need to be resilient to? And, and we'll go into next week some sort of deeper kind of thinking about um, understanding those, those sort of things that can come along and impact on us and asking questions about, particularly about the patterns of those things and how they change. So what does this look like in practice? So I'm not going to go into these in detail, but just some quick snapshots. So if we think, go back to our idea about bouncing back and bouncing forward. So things like, you know, things we all know really well. So insurance is one example of, of a resilient strategy. It's been around for, you know, thousands of years, but it's a really important strategy. But I would put it in this bouncing back kind of column, if you like. So you know, resilience uh, of a system means you can bounce back. Having insurance helps you to bounce back. So, you know, you, you have insurance on, on, you know, machinery or a crop or on your fences or whatever. You have an impact. You know, sure, it takes you a long time to bloody weasel the money out of the bastards, but you get eventually you get your dollars back or you get, you know, your, your insurance policy payout or whatever. But that's, that's bringing you back to where you were. So that's why I'm putting that in this bouncing back column. It's not actually helping you bounce forward necessarily. So if we think about what might look, something look like in this other column, it's, it's things like, for example, skills. So a new set of skills. So learning something new, um, whether that's about a new production system, a new bit of technology, it might be about something about off-farm, earning off-farm income. So in this example, insurance might help you bounce back to get back to where you were, but a new set of skills um, might take you in a totally new direction uh, and allow you to 
to go in a different direction that can um, help you offset um, you know, some of those sort of impacts. If we think about some other, other um, examples, so if we think about native pasture, you know, diverse native pasture, we know that diverse native pastures, having that diversity is a really uh, important resilience idea. Diversity in, in all sorts of forms, diversity in income, diversity in, in pasture, in diversity in um, uh, skills, or those sort of things are really a, a really key idea. So having diversity means if you get hit by something, so if this paddock burns, there'll be some species in there that are going to recover from fire quicker or better than some of the other species in there. They might have all eventually recover over time, but but some of them might recover better or from drought or from you know getting hit hard by grazing or whatever. So having that diversity again is another buffering kind of idea. It helps to buffer, uh, you know, from a range of different impacts that we might get. Over on the other side, if we thought about, um, so that's another bouncing back idea. Over here, a bouncing forward idea might be to say, well, how can we test that diversity? So, you know, can we can we test a range of species? Can we look at, you know, what's the what's the different mix that we might need in different paddocks or on different soil types or in different places in a catchment? to make sure that we have got that diversity but you know we might not know what that range of diversity is or what that range of species so experimenting um, testing innovation you know trialing is something that helps us to bounce forward so these are all resilient strategies but some are more on this kind of bouncing back column and some are more on this bouncing forward the last one is just an example is, you know, something we all know about solar energy, but obviously having solar energy and if you, you know, when you can afford it, batteries and things like that, that's a, again, it's a way to have some backup in the system. So if the, you know, the, the, um, the grid goes down and you've got solar and, and battery backup or whatever, you can keep your pumps running and water your stock or whatever it might be. And that's something that we know about. That again is helping to buffer, it's helping to have some redundancy in the system. So we've got some backup in the system. Over in this column, you know, people would be aware of some of the community type um, uh, solar systems that are popping up around the country. There's a couple down here where I am. And what they've been able to do by, you know, joining together and getting co-ops together and some at the community scale is to put in, you know, solar systems that provide not only backup and buffer, but they generate income for the community. And in an example down here, they've used that income to, to keep the local doctor employed and to keep um, part of the local um, medical system running. So, you know, they've taken an idea that is about, you know, buffering the system and, and um, uh, you know, having that backup, but then they've turned it into something that's giving their community some options and helping the community go forward in the direction that it wants. They're just little quick snapshots of little examples and, and all of those things kind of fall under this idea of resilience. But some are more on this kind of bouncing back, some are more on this bouncing forward. So, you know, over on this side, we talk about things like insurances, having reserves, having backups and redundancy, having buffers there to help us um, to buffer against some of these things, having connections. And really, if you like, I think about this side as, as planning to recover. On the other side, um, we can think much more about um, things like flexibility. So having flexibility is a key strategy in, you know, when you're facing uncertainty and facing the challenges, the unknowns that we don't know, if, you know, we might come up against in the future. Having flexibility is a really core kind of idea or strategy. So having, you know, the ability for a bit of infrastructure or a bit of gear to be able to do multiple jobs is just a, a you know, core idea. Having catalysts, so having things that kind of create more options and more change, um, innovation, new ideas, etc. things that help to multiply, to spread things, to increase them. Uh, and this idea of planning to adapt and planning to transform. So on this side, it's much more about thinking about how do we not just get back to where we were, but how do we actually go in a new direction how do we adapt and change in response to those things that are impacting us? How do we make sure we're not repeating the same patterns um, and, and being caught in a reactive mode of just responding to the same things again and again? And at what point you know, do we have to plan to transform? And that is to sort of do something very different. 
We're going to go into these sorts of things in more detail over the next few weeks, but that's just a little kind of snippet, if you like, um, of some of the you know, practicalities and some of the things that we might think about when we're thinking about resilient systems. Just while, while we're working through some of this stuff, if people have got their own um, you know, resilience building tip, anything that in your mind is a, is a, you know, a way to build resilience, a tip on, on um, something that you've seen that's helped you to either bounce back or to bounce forward, just whack those in the chat so that people can, can see those and, and we'll come back to some of those as we go through the, the, um, the discussion that we're going to have shortly. I actually can't see your hands if you're putting your hands up, so you will need to put it in the chat. Otherwise, wait, uh, hang on to your idea until we get to the, the discussion point. Um, a really sort of simple idea that I want to, uh, uh, and a simple kind of visual that I want to use here and that I want to build on and, and we'll carry this through the four sessions is this idea of what we call this stress curve. So. This is generic, so this is not necessarily talking about personal stress. This could be economic stress. This could be um, financial stress. It could, it could be, you know, community stress that the community is under. But it's a useful idea to think about this kind of curve, if you like, that, you know, any time there's a big event, any time there's a big impact, you get this, this curve. You get, you know, it starts off at some point and it starts to build up and it reaches a peak and then we go into a kind of, um, recovery mode and eventually get back hopefully back to, to similar to where we were. This idea is really important in, in terms of helping us think about what resilience actually does and what it's about and um, if, if you think about the day-to-day -day business you know working working through and, and, um, and running our day-to-day -day lives and our day-to-day -day business we can cope with small amounts of stress. You know, things are going to bounce around and there's always going to be bits and pieces that happen to us. And by and large, if we can keep that stress level low, most of us can cope with those things as, you know, of course, everyone's susceptible to different types of stresses and different things stress different people out in different ways. But, but by and large, when stress is low, you know, most people stay pretty happy and can tick along okay. When that stress level starts to build. This is where things start to become, you know, more, much more challenging and we start to get this sort of sense of pressure on us, um, whether that's, like I say, you know, financial pressure or just overworked or, um, or uh, feeling, you know, at the community level, we can feel that kind of stress and we can particularly see, you know, parts of our community that are under stress, you know, at different times. And this is where um, it does, it is useful to understand actually at, at this kind of um, basic level what goes on in your brain when, when stress starts to bite. So right in the middle there in, in this diagram, you can see the amygdala. So this is a, a really small little structure. You've actually got two, one in each hemisphere of your brain. It's a little tiny um, thing. It's only about the size of an almond. And if you like, it's, it's a really primitive part of our brain. So this is, this is a bit that, you know, evolved very early on, right back when we were um, still evolving as, as humans and, and well before that. And it, what this thing does is really, it, it scans for inputs from all of our senses, from, you know, our, our sight, our, our touch, our smell, our hearing. And it's really focused on keeping us safe. Like, as you can imagine, a really primitive kind of part of the brain like this that's evolved was really designed to, to keep us safe, um, you know, back when we were kind of walking around the jungle or whatever. And so it's really tuned to this kind of fight or flight response. And it was really designed for very short term kind of stresses. So, you know, this is, we're walking through the savannah in the tall grass with a bunch of people and we, uh, we hear a lion roar. This is what kicks in. Uh, it kicks in the adrenaline for a start, and then it kicks in the cortisols, the, the other types of stress hormones, and it helps us act. and And it'll help us to act fairly quickly. And when it does that, it actually um, shuts down a whole lot of other things in our brain. It closes off our digestion. It does all these different things to our body to help us just to act. And it even overrides the prefrontal cortex, which is that green part there. That's the prefrontal cortex is like the kind of boss in your brain. It's the sort of the CEO, if you like, the executive. 
And it's the thing that makes the judgments. The prefrontal cortex is, is the thing that weighs up and balances things. It takes all of the information that it's got. It looks at your past experience, your history. It looks at your values. It looks at the system around you, the social world around you, all those things. And it, and it decides what's the best action to take here. Um, so it's, it's providing judgment, if you like. The amygdala overrides that. So, you know, and that makes sense when you've, being you know chased by a lion it makes sense for that to happen but when we're when we're in a high stress situation for too long that becomes a real problem so cortisols are really you know they're a hormone that is designed to work at a short in short term uh and have that short term effect when it locks in and, and we're in that high stress situation for for longer periods of time that becomes a problem it impairs our decision making it impacts on our health and this is what leads to more serious mental health issues to that um, anxiety, depression, those sorts of things. And, and what you tend to get is a sort of chemical shift and that cortisol keeps you in this high alert, high arousal position all the time. And that, that becomes a problem and it becomes a problem for the way we operate, the way we make decisions, that becomes a problem for our relationships. So when we get to this kind of peak stress, whether this is at our individual level or whether it is the stress that's you know, in the system around us, the financial stress or, or even in our community, that starts to come back and actually starts to impact on us. So even if it's not directly hitting on us or relating directly to us, if we're living in a stressful system, if we're living in a stressful environment, if we're living in a stressful community, we're going to end up in this high stress situation. So whether we like it or not, what happens around us, even if we manage our stress well, eventually it's going to start to impact on us. And that's, that's a problem. And, and one of the key messages really to come out of a lot of resilience work and a lot of thinking that's going on around the world about this stuff now is this connection between what goes on at this level in your brain and what goes on in the world around you and how fundamental that intersection is and that interaction is. So resilience building is really about trying to flatten this curve. You know, we've heard a lot of talk about flattening curves with COVID. Well, resilience building is really about trying to flatten this curve down and so keeping us out of that stress zone. So that's really a lot of the focus of, of what we're trying to do and what we want to talk about over the next few weeks. So when we're thinking about it, we'll go into this in detail next week, but about, you know, there's there's some things we can do before, there's things we can do during and after those stressful kind of events and times that can help us to lower that stress. We know though that we're not dealing with single events, of course, we're never dealing with a single stress curve. We've always got what's happened in the past and we've always got what's, you know, rising in the future. And so that's why we need to become, you know, more tuned and more skilled at managing these curves, if you like, and managing stress. And that's why resilience building and, and trying to think about ourselves, our family, our system, the systems we're connected to and how we manage the, the, the stress in those. So I'm going to wrap up there, just a couple of key points in summary. You know, we, we need to, to build resilience um, to multiple future challenges and there's things we can anticipate and there's other things we can't. And so we need strategies for dealing with the known things and the unknown things. Um, a farm is a system uh, that's embedded in a bigger social, economic and ecological system and, and where and how those things interact is where, you know, is, um, where both the opportunities and the stresses kind of come from and some of those adverse events and all of those things. And so we need to think about how we're embedded. It's not just our farm business, we're embedded in a local system and into bigger um, systems. Resilience, as I mentioned, is not just about bouncing back, but it's also about uh, creating those opportunities to bounce forward. And so we, we need to be doing you know, both. We need to be sort of being defensive, if you like, and bouncing back and making sure we can do that. But we also need to create those opportunities to bounce forward. And finally, this point about managing the stress curve at the, the psychological, the personal level, the community level, and at this kind of people and place level, uh, is a real cornerstone of resilience building. And that's what we're going to talk about over the next um, three sessions. Okay, so that's quite a lot of stuff. I know I've just thrown a lot of stuff at you fairly quickly, but I'm going to open it up now to, uh, we'll have a look at what's what's in the chat and we'll, um, we, we can also open it up for questions. If people have got comments or questions, anything they want to ask, anything they 
they want to mention. I, I won't go through, so there's some really good little tips here about, you know, running stock at 80% capacity. And that's a, that's a um, one from Paul there about, you know, that's a, a classic buffer idea. So you're not running at maximum capacity all the time. You're actually leaving a bit of buffer in the system. So you've got a bit of fat on the bone. You've got a bit there to absorb when things, you know, you might misjudge your rainfall or your, your feed budgets or whatever that you know you've actually got a little bit of breathing space there. So a bit of free board. Um, fodder reserves and, and um, having those, uh, you know, things in reserve. Um, so some really good comments there. Uh, you'll see that um, Liz has put a, a little feedback form there. If you if you wouldn't mind, just only take literally take a couple of minutes to do that feedback would be really useful. But other than that, can I just open it up for any any comments, any questions people have got? Happy to just um, for people to jump in in any way. Well, I've got a question for you. Um, just that, like, if you um, drought preparedness and and sort of you know, there's going to be a lot of hay cut this year and probably a lot of cheap grain going getting stored underground. What where does that fit in your um, in your columns? Is that a bounce back or is that a bounce forward? Oh, in my mind, it's a it's a bounce back. Rowan, but but if you do it in a way, you could think about that doing it in a way that gives you much more flexibility, but also maybe gives you some new opportunities because you might be able to, you know, sell that grain in the future, or you might be able to, you know, look at other opportunities to use that in a different way. So you could see it as just bouncing back. It's going to be a buffer. It might help you if you get, if we run into really dry conditions next year. So you might have it as a buffer. But you might also use it as some way to generate some some dollars in some other way as well. So it could it could also be in a bouncing forward if you like. So you know there's no there's no hard and fast rule here, and some of those things might fall into both. So let's hope it is. Um, if people can put a bit away and 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 can you know do both actually use it as a buffer and but also maybe hope if you make a few dollars out of it if if the conditions are right. Thank you. Um, great tip there from, from Trish about, uh, you know, put that checklist about how you're going on the fridge and use it regularly. It's really, and, and if, you, if you haven't seen that, there's, um, we'll, we'll circulate that around, but it's a really great checklist just to do a self check or to, you know, your people around you, your loved ones around you that actually really helps you to keep an eye on yourself and how you're traveling and how people around you are traveling. And it's really well done, really well communicated. So that, that's a really great tip there, Liz. Um, Sharon, just, yeah, what are some of the typical barriers that people experience in bouncing forward? Um, it, there is, I mean, all of those things you mentioned there, of course, you know, some things require resources. And if you're, if you're stuck, you know, under financial stress, you're not gonna have those resources to bring to bear. And that's why it's so important now when conditions are a bit better is to to try and top up those reserves you know obviously um, uh, getting money in the bank helps and and so having that there as, as something to fall back on but your other two things are actually really important to courage and peer pressure and there's some really nice work done that showed that the farmers this was to do with um, peanut growers in Queensland but it's been replicated again and again that the farmers who were the most transformative adapters. So the people who were taking those big leaps forward were the people that had the weakest um, uh, social networks, but the strongest information networks. So they weren't very strongly socially connected, um, but they were very, they had very strong information networks. And, and the people who were the, the, the sort of more incremental, perhaps the, you know, taking a small step, not a big leap, but a small step, were the people that were the strongest, had the strongest social connections, but they had weak information networks. And what the researchers kind of drew out of this was the people that were taking those big leaps weren't being constrained by peer pressure. So they weren't necessarily too worried about what people around them thought and they were willing to experiment and trial and use a range of things. And they did that by having those strong information networks. 
in contrast, the people that had the very strong social networks were much more um, concerned about their social network and about doing what other people were doing or not getting too far away or too far ahead from their social network. So peer pressure was definitely playing a role there in terms of how those people kind of operated and they tended to get their information from just within that network. So if your network is not very innovative, for example, or you know, it might be more conservative in its, in its kind of the steps it's taking, then you know, you're, you're limiting yourself in terms of that ability to take steps forward. So definitely peer pressure and courage, you know, and, and it, it does take courage to you take risks and, and it can sometimes go wrong, we all know that. So there is definitely, you know, some challenges with taking those bigger leaps, but all of those things play some kind of role there, Sharon, for sure. So we're up, we're up against the time where we said we'd, we'd finish. I'm happy to just hang around if people have got any, um, uh, you know, other just comments, questions, anything else more generally, or just want to chew the fat about anything, uh, feel free to jump in. So Liz has just posted in the, the chat there the, the handbook, the Helping Hands um, book. Uh, that's a fantastic resource. I'd really just um, stress to people that, that, you know, that's that's something to go and have a look at, download it, uh, and put that little checklist on the fridge or print it out and stick it on the office wall and, and do that check-in and just keep yourself um, uh, in tune with what's happening or with the people around you. So great, fantastic resource. So, Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Liz. That, that was excellent and, and, and really helpful. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, we'd like to, we can do the next um, 15 minutes in conversation out of recording if people are wanting to carry on. On um, behalf of the team, I would like to thank everyone for attending. And don't forget to provide your feedback and register for our next one, which isn't next week, it's fortnightly. Um, so we'll be back again in two weeks on the 1st of October.